This is Duke University. Today we have Tracy, um, and um, Clara was going to say a word about Tracy. So, yeah. but uh, we're actually going to leave it up to Tracy to talk about Tracy. <laughs> yes. So we've made her raise her hand. But Tracy, I think uh, she'll talk more about this. First, met Eileen online, so these, yes. these things are these things how things bubbles up, happen. Like yes, um, and I know Tracy a bit more because she participated in NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month in November. And Yay! That's one of the things one, we do here. No, I did not win. Matter. But I, a winner. I, I won in my heart. In your heart. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so again, a, a writer, a fiction writer, and someone who's been with us um, for a while now. Mm -hmm. And that's probably all I'm going to say. That works. You, you wanted to introduce yourself and talk about yourself. I, I want to say one final thing about, especially meeting Tracy online, is that when Claire and I conceived of the lab, one of the first things we talked about, we were joking about Bob Putnam's famous book of sociology called Bowling Alone. And we said, well, we really want to write a book called Shipping Together. Because really what, what uh, we saw in Fangirl versus Fanboy Life, I'm sure that's something Tracy will talk about, is that um, to broadly um, uh, stereotype genders, it did seem that fandom, that if Fanboy Life was more about accumulation of goods and toys, that Fangirl Life is often productive, you know, making videos, <laughs> writing fan fiction, um, building community, raising for charitable causes, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of fangirls in the room, I can tell. And, um, and so one of the things that was really exciting was to think about what kinds of communities have stories enabled. And that's one of the driving forces behind um, the very existence of Story Lab, as Claire and I can see, and this is why we think it's particularly special to have uh, Tracy, who is a scholar on the subject and a fan girl herself, um, talk about this topic. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to sit down, but I just wanted to do a quick thank you to Story Lab for supporting me. And, and I'll get to this in the talk, um, but so much of this research, formal research, began in 2016 for this project. Um, and Story Lab supported me in helping me get to Geek Girl Con, which I'll talk about later, um, last fall in Seattle, which was an amazing um, opportunity for me to sort of bring so much of my research full circle. So I just wanted to plug them for that support in helping research continue to happen um, and also in paying for me to go to a con which is pretty much like a fangirl's dream is that somebody else wants to pay for you to go um, and talk about comic books so that's what I did um, so just to sort of to start with this uh, title slide um, I really want to um, draw your attention to the subtitle it's not there just for uh, you know for no good reason um, fangirls Digital Tribes and Social Movements is very much the order in which I discovered this community. Um, fangirl being something that was very close to my heart as far as an identifier, but then Digital Tribes being something that I learned through research, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, and then Social Movements is, is it was sort of like on top of Digital Tribes almost as soon as I started researching this group. Um, so I wanted to just draw your attention to that. So this is really a, a little bit of a, a, a slide to help you understand me and where I come from from a research perspective. Um, I went to UNC Chapel Hill. I was a, an undergraduate there, a little school down the road with the color blue that I like also. <laughs> um, and I got, my gra I got my undergraduate degree in communication studies um, and uh, my focus, my minor was English but I did a lot of creative writing there as well. My master's degree was also from UNC, um, directly following, and that was a graduate degree in communication studies with a focus on performance studies. And communication studies at UNC is particularly interdisciplinary. Um, there's Larry Grossberg there, who is sort of a powerhouse in cultural studies, um, was a part of my curriculum. Um, Della Pollock, DeSwaney Madison, these are big names in performance studies and also in cultural studies and narrative, um, and folklore. Uh, so I want to talk about that. So really, that's where I, from a research, from a scholarly perspective, um, that's where I was born. Um, and we'll talk about that as an introduction. Um, I will just tell a quick story about that, that when I was my first semester of graduate school, we had a guest speaker come in and say, you know, let's go around the room and talk about your research interests and your projects, um, which is sort of like a nightmare question to ask a first semester <laughs> graduate student. Um, and when they got to me, I just froze up and I just sort of blurted out the first thing that came to mind, um, which was, I'm interested in deception and shape-shifting, <laughs> which sounds like a crazy answer, but it actually is exactly what I was interested in. I was, I was really very much interested in um, what does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to be true to oneself? Welcome, come on in. 
I think we can pull some chairs up. Um, what, does it, what does it mean to um, tell a story about oneself? How does identity, and uh, what are the limitations of identity in terms of telling stories about ourselves? Um, so that deception shape-shifting answer is actually quite good and appropriate for me. So these are the questions, like I said, that I was asking. I was asking, you know, I was introduced to identity studies as like, you know, these, these big categories that we're all familiar with, race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, ability, um, among others. And so I said, okay, well, those I understand, but what other very authentic identities are available to us? How else can we talk about ourselves? Where are we allowed to play with identity? Um, because I think uh, culturally, the idea of playing with identity or not, not being clear about identity is sort of uh, tagged on top of being inauthentic, and I don't think that's quite, that didn't seem right to me. I was like, I think there's other ways to talk about oneself. So for my master's thesis project, I said, okay, so what are the stories, what are the places where you can play with identity? So for me, that drew me immediately to the trickster figure as an archetype. If you're familiar with this archetype, this is something that um, is seen globally, but I chose the, the global south, in particular West Africa and the Yoruba tradition, to look at the trickster issue, um, a messenger, someone, uh, a figure who is, speaks in many tongues, a figure who plays on languages, a figure who um, misrepresents, represents himself, um, and works between humans and the gods. And then I also looked at Superman because I'm a fangirl, like I said, um, and I feel very much that Superman is sort of an American myth. Um, and I asked these questions about him, you know, who is he, what he does, who is he? I was really fascinated with, in particular, this image here of the phone booth, because the, even though I'm a Supergirl or Superman uh, fangirl, I really love the superpowers, but that's not why I'm interested in him. I'm interested in him because he carries all of these different identities all the time, right? Like he is Kal-El, the son of Krypton, he is Clark Kent, he is Superman. Um, some of these names were given to him, some of them he, he adopted in these ways. But he also is really essentially a character who has to manage all three of those identities. Like that to me is his core. Um, is this right here, this space where he has to make a decision about who he's going to be in this next moment? So I wanted to talk about that. Like that's a place where he's allowed to play and also He's a liar. Like he, he is not honest every day, but he's heroic, right? And so to me, I was like, okay, so you can be inauthentic, but it can also be heroic is how I see Superman. Um, so the next project I wanna talk about is this, uh, this project called Fooding Race um, that I did as a graduate student. Um, and here, if, you, if you're in the room and you've ever been called an Oreo, then I don't need to explain it to you, but this idea of being Black of skin, but white in performance. And of course, this draws on Judith Butler's theory of gender performativity. Judith Butler says that um, gender is a performance, it's mim mimesis, it's repetition. We do acts that perform our gender over and over and over again. And so that's where gender comes from. For me, this was really ringing true in terms of this critique that calling someone an Oreo is critiquing their performance of their race. Um, and so I came up with this paper, it won uh, the debut paper at National Communication Association, um, and I really was looking at how do you diagnose authenticity and how are slurs a part of diagnosing someone's identity authenticity. Um, and so for me it was conceptualizing this Cartesian split between um, praxis, right, what do you do, and epidermis, what, what your skin is. So these are things that were really fascinating to me. I really felt like the slur was a form of consumption, not just because of this food, but it was a way of eating the anxiety of someone's performance. It was a way of eating, consuming the anxiety of someone who was a faulty clone. Um, and so this quote is from Rebecca Schneider, um, one of the researchers I drew on, and she also draws on Butler quite a bit. Um, the clone is unnerving because the cultural fear of mimesis is a fear of indiscreet origins. So I really felt like that was, it's really uh, resonant to me, this idea of the clone and why the clone is scary, why the clone needs to be addressed and in this case corrected by this slur. So I'm getting to geek girls here. I'm telling you sort of how we, how I process all of these understandings of identity. Um, and then these are the next questions that I started asking myself when I graduated. How does technology provide new ways of interacting with narratives? How do fans and affinity groups perform their fandom online? Um, how is fandom 
performed, right? So we've talked about how hero heroism is performed, how authentic authenticity is performed, how race, gender are performed, how is fandom performed. So that started three years of my work in the video game industry. Um, I was a voiceover artist, producer, dialogue writer, um, but my video game work was for a very specific type of game, um, a game that adapted one type of experience into a digital interactive one for fans of a pre-existing property like Ario Speedwagon. <laughs> so one of my projects was an Ario Speedwagon hidden object game. Um, what Ario Speedwagon's um, promotional team figured out was that their chief fan group, their demographic, were women sort of in the like 30 to 45 range. Um, that is exactly almost the same demographic of women who like casual hidden object games. And so they asked us to produce a video game that incorporated their entire Find Your Own Way Home album, which came out in 2007, into a video game. Um, so that's what I was tasked to do. Each song had like a different level. Um, and the character was very much a Mary Sue. If you know what a Mary Sue is, it's sort of the self-insert character, often female, often perfect, often beautiful with abilities no one has ever seen before. Um, and so that's who this character was. Uh, Sundance Channel, similarly, skewing younger in the demographic, wanted to adapt uh, New York Fashion Week into an interactive game because they said, okay, we've got these fans who love fashion and they love our full frontal fashion show. How can we invite them to interact with us online? Um, and so that was my work there. Um, six years ago, I began working with Duke Tip in their online and innovation area. And we use story in a variety of ways to engage, inspire, educate gifted kids. That is me. Um, but this is not me. This was, this was a set that we were on to film a scene based in Egypt. Um, so as you can see, so I'm tracking story, identity, authenticity, participation. All of these things have been swirling for me for a really long time. Um, and really, I got to this core question. What if we are the stories we like? like is that possible? We are at a place from a technological perspective where we are interacting with people that we may never meet. Interacted with Eileen, but I did meet her. But there, there's a world, there's an alternate universe where Eileen and I never met in person and we are still friends, right? So what if we are interacting with each other based on the stories you're like, what does that do? Um, and so I wanted to segue into Geek Girls that way, but also let you guys know a little bit more about myself. So. Fangirl Geeky Tracy. These are academic, professional, artistic Tracy. I'll talk to you about fangirl Tracy. So I am a Marvel girl all the way. Um, I do like DC. I appreciate DC, but Marvel is where my heart is. Uh, I like those stories. I identify with them. I really like Iceman. I just have this thing for Iceman. He's just, he's sort of amazing and pitiful at the same time. I love it. Um, I'm a Slytherin, as you can tell. I have my Slytherin guard. Don't hiss at me. No. What are you, Gryffindor? Like, no. No. Um, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with ambition is what I will say. Um, so I'm also a Rey fangirl. I'm delighted by this character. I love this character. When she picked up the lightsaber, I, my heart sang. I was not ready for that moment. Um, and I really like Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon is my gateway drug into anime. Yes, yes, Sailor Moon fan in the room. Um, there's something about that that I will just always owe allegiance to as a fangirl. Um, I love tropes. My favorite is the chosen one trope. I would read about a chosen one who has extra special powers and is destined to do something all day, every day. Um, I also really love Sequest. So if anybody remembers Sequest DSV, um, 20 years ago, I wrote my very first fanfic. And it was a Sequest DSV fanfic. You will never find it because I will never tell you where it is. Um, I was 14. I wrote an original character, a Mary Sue, which is, of course, fan lingo for self-insert. It was me. I basically wanted to be on Sequest. So I wrote a story and a sequel to that story about me being on Sequest. Um, I'm also a Doctor Who fan. The 10th Doctor is my doctor. I've cosplayed as Martha Jones there uh, because she's awesome and I wanted to feel awesome like her. So these are the things that I squee over. Um, if you don't know what squeeing is, imagine yourself shrieking in delight, but inside. So like, you're shrieking, it's up here, 
but inside. <laughs> um, so that's a squee. It means that you like something a lot. Um, I've been a fangirl since before the internet, and I've been a fangirl after the internet. Um, and the differences are remarkable because reaching one another is so much easier. If I want to go deep for my love on Iceman, if I want to go deep for my love on Iceman between specific issues in Uncanny X-Men where he's particularly pitiful, I can do that. The internet will let me go deep in that way, um, and I will meet people there who are like, yes, that is my jam also. Um, so that is what the internet has allowed me to do personally. Um, so just segueing a little bit into how we get into hashtags here. So this chart, which is a little bit hard to see, um, it's a point-wise mutual information chart, PMI chart. So the words that go this way are more nerdy in blue. The words that go up or more geeky in yellow. Um, so Burr Settles is a software engineer. In 2013, he uh, looked at 2.6 million tweets um, over the course of about a month, actually. It wasn't very long. Um, and he sampled tweets that matched the query terms geek and nerd. Um, by comparing the, the tweets in each query, he was able to develop this scatter plot using PMI statistics to measure how much company words keep with one another. Um, and this was his conclusion. In broad strokes, it seems to me that geeky words are more about stuff, while nerdy words are more about ideas. Geeks are fans, and fans collect stuff. Nerds are practitioners, and practitioners play with ideas. Of course, geeks can collect ideas, and nerds can play with stuff too. Plus, they aren't two distinct personalities as much as different aspects of personality. This was his interpretation. So I saw that. I did this little bit of research, and I was like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, collecting things is not for me. But I have spent hours on all of these things, like hours. I have more. I have two Martha costumes, OK? Like I, from different episodes. Um, so so I've, I've invested in these stories and I identify with these stories, but I didn't collect all the things. You know, I don't have all of the issues. Um, so what I was doing without knowing it, because I don't think that term was quite in circulation yet, was I was interested in transformative works. So I'm gonna pause a little bit and talk about transformative works. So fan work, fan works, um, it can include fan fiction, fan art, cosplay, fan vids, um, podcasts, films. Um, there are so many different forms of it. I found some Sims skins from Sims 3 The Game for that Catwalk Countdown game. Somebody was so much a fan of the game that I produced that they made skins for their Sim characters so they could see those characters move more. That's a fan work. Um, memes, even GIFs, are fan works. Um, so, just to take a minute to look at this, a transformative work, this is a legal definition according to transformativeworks.org, takes something extant and turns it into something with a new purpose, sensibility, or mode of expression with these examples. So that's the type of labor that I was doing uh, 20 years ago when I wrote my Sequest fanfic, um, but I didn't realize that was the labor that I was doing. So thinking about that, contrasting it with Settle's graph, where he just looked for geek and nerd, and it was just like, geeks collect stuff does not resonate, right? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. So I looked around, and there are a lot of amazing um, geeky writers on the internet, female writers in particular, scholars. Foz Meadows is an essay essayist and author who writes quite a bit about fandom for the Huffington Post, among other things. She's, an, she's a novelist and a poet. Um, and so she has a quote. She says, the types of fandom that are most often considered traditional and acceptable and which are often either male-dominated or coded as masculine, tend to be acquisitive, whether in terms of knowledge, like obscure trivia, or merchandise, collectibles. Whereas, by contrast, the types of fandom most often considered insincere, non-serious, or unreal, and which are often either female-dominated or coded as feminine, tend to be creative, such as making costumes, writing fanfic, and drawing fan art. So this is a picture from Geek Girl Con 2017. This, these ladies were walking in a group and I just said, can I take a picture of you? And they immediately had a pose. Like, they, they had practiced this pose. This was not by accident. They have faces. They were ready. Um, and I quite love this. 
This is a sketch of Luke Skywalker that I did when I was 13. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure anybody could tell it was Luke Skywalker, so clearly I just, I wrote his name. It might have been Jonathan Brandis. We'll talk about that later. That's a different presentation. Um, but so I was making fan art. At I didn't know that's what I was doing. I was just really into Star Wars, and I had this idea in my head that I just wanted to, to make out of it, right? I, I was so passionate that I needed to draw um, Luke Skywalker. So I want to pause and let um, a couple other voices in the room. I have some audio. I have some audio files, and I wouldn't be worth my salt as a performance studies scholar, as a folklorist, as a media studies person if I didn't tell you two things before I play this clip. One is that I cut it for some adult themes, which is a different late night panel that we won't be doing here. Uh, but then also, too, that I very much invite you to go to Imaginary Worlds podcast to listen to the whole thing yourself. It's a, maybe a 20 minute episode. It's really, really amazing. Um, but this is a quote and conversation between the podcast host, Eric and Francesca Coppa, who helped found the Organization for Transformative Works. Who wrote that definition, that legal definition that I put up there before. We talked to Francesca Coppa, who's a professor at Mullenberg College. She studies fan fiction. She wrote a book called The Fan Fiction Reader. Um, and I myself have been a fangirl since I was about, you know, 12. Uh, so I have some cred in that area, too. She was totally fascinating. Like, I didn't know that fan fiction... I thought it started with Star Trek, fan fiction as we know it. And she was saying that it started... Well over 100 years ago with Sherlock Holmes. And almost right away, people started writing more Holmes. Uh, and they did a lot of the things that we associate with modern fandom, like they had a campaign. I mean, he killed Holmes off after the 10th story. And people you know, wore black armbands and they protested in the streets and they wrote letters and they made him bring him back. And so and then this was like a worldwide trend of people writing stories about Holmes and Watson. Yeah, and back then it was uh, those stories were mostly written by men, so there wasn't that that stigma that's currently attached to fan fiction. It was like a gentlemanly pursuit back then. Exactly, and now it's mostly fan fiction is mostly written predominantly by women and read by women as well. Yeah, and then also Francesca pointed out there's another difference between fan fiction then and now. We're only having a special episode about this because we're in a place with intellectual property, which is a very recent phenomenon where suddenly this very natural making stories out of other people's stories is being legislated. Uh, only special people are allowed to tell stories out of our common culture, at least in this legal sense. But fans are saying, well, but this is the human activity. We want to tell more stories. And you kind of can't stop us. It's, it's a kind of illegal act, but it's a profoundly human act. And then, of course, we get to modern fan fiction with Star Trek. We still know those original women who, who kind of built Star Trek fandom. But many of them were, in fact, professional science fiction writers. And, in fact, there was originally a Hugo Award for fan fiction writing. Um, and then there was a kind of split where basically, like, science fiction book fandom kind of felt that women science fiction writers liked Star Trek kind of too much and for the wrong reasons, which is, by the way, something people always tell women. We like the story too much and for the wrong reasons. So we'll segue into that clip, clip in a minute, but I wanted to just pause and, and, and repeat that quote. Um, women like the story too much and for the wrong reasons. Um, so that is a preview a little bit of, of what I'm gonna talk about soon, which is the, the division or the opportunity for division within the tribe about what it means to like something and like it too much. Um, so this segues into 2016 for me personally when I started uh, working with Negar Motahede, at, um, who's professor in literature, associate professor in literature here at Duke. Um, she's an amazing, amazing uh, resource, visual me new media studies. She did work, she has an entire book on hashtag Iran election. Um, and so she gave me some tools to be able to continue to ask and answer some of these questions. So as fangirls, we love stories, but what are the stories that tell us? And are online fangirls an identity group? If so, what type? So Rahaf Farhoush, who is, uh, or Rahaf Harfush, sorry, um, who is pictured here, um, came to Duke in 2016. Um, she works closely with Nagar. She's a strategist. Um, she worked on the Obama campaign in 2008, pretty revolutionary social media online community campaign um, that we're, we're going to be talking about, I think, for a long time in terms of new media studies and what was accomplished there. Um, and she has some interest, she's a digital anthropologist, um, but she has a really interesting take on what that means. So I'm going to read a quote from her. When we were using tractors or wood to start fires, 
there was always a very clear definition between a person and the tool. And we've continued to assume with technology that this distance exists, when in reality we're seeing that it's actually disappearing. The distance between human beings and their technology is blurring, and so it's resulting in new behaviors, new belief systems, new structures in a way that is fundamentally redesigning how we live our lives. So this is her take on digital anthropology, and she's got quite a few frameworks through which I was able to do this research. So Rahaf and Nagar um, are sort of a dynamic duo, and they work together to come up with this analytical framework for online communities in these four categories. So you can see sort of where Perhaps you can even project for yourselves where you have seen these types of communities form up. Um, so in particular, single servings, which is a recent addition, um, is about like a retweet or a like. So an online community, so if, some, if a tweet goes really, really viral and there's like 30,000 retweets and you were involved in that retweet, um, that's a single serving engagement with that content. Um, and you were a part of the community that really liked it, but you didn't do much. It was very short term, low intimacy. You didn't really know the other people who retweeted, right? Final Four is, you know, hours of time. People may be excited about it for months and months and months, but it takes a very short amount of time. And final, hashtag Final Four might trend for, what, like two days or something? Um, and then there's these ecologies when people are like, oh, I'm a, uh, you know, Star Wars is over 30, uh, three decades old. Um, <laughs> So, or four, I think at this point, but so you may be, I'm a fan of Star Wars, but you kind of come in and out of it. You're not really particularly interested in the online community. You don't have like maybe a tribe that you're working with. Um, so the question here is where do geek girls land? Um, spoiler alert, they're a tribe. Um, but, and I'll talk about that, but it, I'll also call out prison wives. It's a really interesting one. Um, a tri tribe of women who have been left in a sort of like the odyssey sense um, by their partners and are connecting on the internet through their shared experiences of being left behind. Um, that's a really interesting tribe that I won't get into, but it's just to give you an example of how tribes can form up and why. So Rahaf um, and Nagar have called out particular aspects of tribes to study. So these are ways in to grab content, to grab artifacts, to grab research, to sort of get a sense of the shape of a tribe. And I'm gonna use this framework throughout the rest of my talk um, because this is the way that I went into this research. I looked for these things. Um, I added to their, their list um, holidays, material events, so um, which I think Nagar, particularly with the Iran election, would, would add to as well. Um, anniversaries, um, and so these are the, if you just want to keep this in mind, I'll show this a, a slide again. These are the things that I was looking for and what I'm going to talk about next. In particular, I want to call out the wound. So the idea of the wound is that a digital tribe has been, is high intimacy, high contact, uh, long-term commitment. So there's something in this group, there's an event typically um, that has divided the group, caused strife. That the fact that there is a wound means that there's high intimacy, right? Like if you don't know anyone and some big event happens and you're on opposite sides of it, you're not really upset. It's not causing a wound to you. But because of the high intimacy and because of long-term engagement, um, it creates the context for a big event that's controversial to create a wound within the group. And that is a defining factor for tribes <clears throat> that makes them very different from like an ecology, for example. Um, and so that's something that we're constantly we're coached to look for when I was working with Nagar. It's like, where's the wound? Where's the wound? How's the wound and what it is def define value? So keep that in the back of your mind. Um, there are limits to this type of research, as with all research. Um, these are the anthropology sort of um, methods that I drew on. Here are some of the theorists that I worked with, not all of them. Um, and I guess one thing I will point out, too, is I'm going to show you lots of tweets from Twitter. Um, individual tweets don't show up in a search if that account got deleted. So while I say this is the first tweet uh, that mentioned this hashtag, it's the first tweet I found, and my search techniques are so-so, um, but that doesn't mean it's the very first tweet because somebody could have tweeted and then deleted their account and then we just don't see that. And so um, you have to use other methods. And I also use the Wayback Machine if you don't know about that. It's a, an internet archive resource um, that, I, that I live and die by. Um, all right, so getting into some of this collective stuff that I've looked at for, for Geek Girls. 
So Geek Girls on Twitter, which is the, probably the main platform I'm going to cite, um, was first used in 2009, January of 2009, um, by this individual, Andreas. He was talking from an IT perspective, so more sort of computers, networking, um, and he mentioned this, um, he had this observation, all posts on the start page of Mashable are by female editors. Geek girls, right? And then he says, currently all posts are this. So he's like trying to draw attention to this thing. Do a status quo on fem IT. So he's trying to sort of ping out, like somebody needs to talk about this phenomenon that's happened. But the first use, this is where things get interesting for me. The very first use of the hashtag as a call for community for, for geek girls uh, was by Riley Geek, who sadly deleted her account, so I'm glad that I took all these screenshots. Um, so the first tweet before is January, this is March of 2009. Um, so she used it to call for community and connection. Show me some love, hashtag geek girls. She used Mr. Tweet, and um, if you are an old time Twitter user, Mr. Tweet, we follow, there were all these different mechanisms to try and connect to people because hashtags were not linked at this time. Mm -hmm. And so people were trying to, were constantly trying to find other people who were interested, and so they had to use these third party tools which are just like defunct now. Um, but then this was the first association here between geek girls, tech, in comics. So the first time Geek Girls was associated with both technology and fandom um, was Riley Geek. And she's clearly like, she's calling out, like, who else is out there? Hey, hit me up. I want to talk to you. April, so she did this in March, April of that same year, she founded Geek Girls Network, which is a pretty formidable, formidable blog at the time. It's on WordPress. It's still up there. She left it, but you can go into the archives and see some of the work that they were doing there. Um, so she just created a space, right? Like she was like, okay, nobody's responding, or maybe Mr. Tweet went down, I don't know. And then she said, I'm going to make a space for myself. This is Geek Girls Network. It's literally a network where I can sort of connect to women. So this is an interesting sort of precursor to the wound, an interesting tease of the wound, I think. Um, in June of 2009, there was a, a Flash Belt conference. I don't even know if they do this anymore because Flash is not what it once was, but um, a conference um, for Adobe Flash developers, more in the IT realm of geekiness, right? And a keynote speaker there presented an explicit and pornographic presentation that focused on women's body parts, mimicked sex on an, an, an animated woman. It was like such in poor taste, but it was the keynote, right? And there were women in the audience. And so there were all these negative reactions on Twitter, because this is when everyone was just live tweeting everything. We just figured that out. Um, and the negative reactions were being responded to by other men who were saying men are, the, the women are prudish, they're, they're easily offended, um, excuses were being made. That's just, that's just hoss, you know? Um, and so, Immediately, there started from women who were there, developers who were there. They started sort of counter countering this with pros not prudes, and so there was a, a trend, a small like mini campaign of pros not prudes of women who were in the audience who were IT and what they considered geek girls um, who were not who said we don't we have a right to not be offended in our in our business space, right? Um, a prominent this prominent website, Geek Girls Guide, is really the person, really the organization that started this. So this is an early indicator of what it means to be a geek girl on the internet. In that, in some cases, you what you're going to have to do is fight for this identity or fight for this this right. Um, this is something that I, I remember. Um, San Diego Comic Con, if you don't know, is just the this massive, biggest, maybe one of the biggest, not the biggest, um, but comic conventions. Now it's quite commercial. There's lots of movies and producers and, and um, actors who attend. But at the time, they, uh, LA Times posted a girl's guide to Comic Con, and it basically reduced girls' interest to Comic Con to just coming for, like, male stars, not really because they're interested in comics or story or all of the reasons that, you know, drive someone to draw a sketch of Luke Skywalker. Um, and so there are all these reactions. This is from io9, which is a, a science fiction fancy blog. Um, my favorite about this is Speaking as a fangirl raised by and with four girl geeks, I am ticked off. Not since the viewing of Spider-Man 3 <laughs> have I been in such an outrage. Um, which I love that because, yes, that was, that was a horrible experience. <laughs> uh, but that just shows you the ire, right? Um, and so this highlights you know, and previews further controversies and slights to this geek girl community. Um, Riley Geek got involved and sent out a URL to Wired's Geek Dad article where he was standing up for geek girls. 
io9 ran this this article is it not really for girls critiquing the la times and what they put out and some of the reactions um, in response to what happened in 2009 a group of prominent geek girls on the internet um, i don't have all of them tagged here um, but they they got together prompted by geek girl diva who's a blogger who also knows riley geek by the way um, and she wrote this post, geek girls like unicorns don't exist. And so this is when we're not quite, while we're fighting for sort of a sense of equality, the geek girls are actually now just fighting to say they exist, right? So instead, we're not even at the point now where we're fighting for authenticity. We're just saying we're real. <laughs> um, so there's this assertion of existence um, that, that started to rise up where this unicorn, like we're not a unicorn, we actually exist. Um, and so the Geek Girl Diva and Riley Geek duo got together with these women to put in a panel submission to San Diego Comic Con, the site of the wound from 2009, right? Um, to do a Geek Girls Exist panel and it filled to standing, standing room only. Um, there was a tweet up party at San Diego Comic Con that July um, that also was really, really popular and they, um, the, the tweets from that event are, are amazing and hilarious and joyful um, and this is my favorite one hell yeah we exist and we're all over your fandoms getting cooties on everything um, and so cooties on everything was sort of the theme I think for 2010 and again this is a year later right so San Diego comic-con and LA Times make a lot of women geeks really angry a year later they mobilize and say we're gonna be at the panel we're actually gonna go to that space and do our own thing there um, and the response to all of that actually did get picked up it did get addressed it did get seen um, and in September 2010, Team Unicorn, um, which is a group of actresses and geeks, got together. They created this, this music video that went pretty viral at the time. Um, it's, it's a fun video if you want to watch it. Um, it's pretty branded. I mean, it feels like very social media ready for virality. Um, but it was great. And there are lyrics about what we like and what we do. Um, they were still funny. They were still sexy. But they were also big geeks and uh, a lot of deep cuts, a lot of good references in that music video if you're a nerd. Um, so other things that happened from that 2009 issue about San Diego, San Diego Comic Con, um, one of the biggest things was that Geek Girl Con, a convention specifically to celebrate the female geek, came out of that. So the panel caught fire. Conversations on the panel were talking about conventions. Members of that panel, that group of women I showed you, also mobilized with other interested parties and said, within months, by the way, because San Diego Comic Con is July. This is this is like September, um, mobilized a convention in Seattle. It met for the first time and had 4,000 people attend. Um, 400 of those attendees were under 10 years old. Um, and this is a quote from this year's Geek Girl Con. Um, this is the one that Story Lab sent me to. And I, you know, seven years later, we still see these tones, right? We see you, like you exist. We're committed to fostering community in solidarity, right? Like, so there's still this message, even seven years later, that this, this assertion has to keep happening. This is a map from the, the, pan, or the con last year, one of the floors. And I, if you can see, all of the rooms have names of female characters. So if you were like, where are you going? You're like, I'm going to the storm room. I'm going to the ray room. I'm going to Uhura room. I mean, like, so you were just never really without reminders of these female characters and what they represent in the stories, knowing full well that all of us are so attached to like one of these characters and you really wanted to go to that space and be in that space. Even if the panel was not something you wanted to go to, you wanted to go to the Ray room so you could go there. Um, so let's check back in, right, to the aspects of the tribe. So, so far, you guys have learned about, if you haven't heard it before, Mary Sue. You know about fanfic, you know about transformative works. Um, we have some leaders. We've talked about Francesca Coppa. Uh, we've talked about the Geek Girl, uh, San Diego Comic Con group, several hashtags, tweets, tweets and posts, archetypes, the unicorn, um, and then the material events, both the Comic Con uh, panel, the tweet up, and then we've also got Geek Girl Con, which is a pretty significant reaction. And all these things are in a line, right? So, then I started looking into the hashtag more specifically. And so, okay, what is the work of the hashtag? What work is it doing? Um, and for me, it was a ping in the network, um, inspired by Sonar. 
Uh, it's a network ping that does multiple things. It identifies the sender, requests a response, echo response, measures time, receives a reply, echo response. Um, so it's more than just identifying an object, it's putting a call out there and asking for, for confirmation. So for, for me, the hashtag in a lot of these posts are cyclical and they reverberate in this sense. They, they're, they're like a tribal call out into the wild. So they initiate, they receive, they respond, they echo back across the networked chasm of pop subcultures, sub subcultures. Um, they create this constant reverb action that affirms each individual's existence, the existence of the tribe, the everyday life of the, the tribe. In fact, actually I'll go back. In Spanish, you can't read it, but it says, chicas, you are not alone, hashtag geek girls. So geek girls exist and they come in a multiplicity of forms. You may not recognize them in everyday life, but the internet and this ping and this hashtag tells you that they are there. So rituals uh, and practices, I wanted to talk about those. Um, so these are two that I'll talk briefly about. A call out practice, which is not unusual in fandom at all. Um, it's about calling out, and typically, content producers um, for maybe a um, gap or a mishap or a mistake. It's a form of geektivism because these campaigns actually result in change many times. Um, and then slice of life selfie rituals. And we'll talk about what it means to claim and reclaim an identity in domestic space for a selfie. So call outs. Um, they directly engage with content producers um, and that's what social media and Twitter in particular allows us to do, right? Um, and so this is one of my favorite examples, which is the hashtag Where's Ray campaign. Um, when Star Wars, um, The Force Awakens came out, people were so excited, you know, they had sort of like hidden that Ray was force sensitive and we didn't know that she was gonna be Jedi. But then when you found out, there were just no toys of her anywhere. And you would go to Target and just sort of walk, you know, it'd be like, you know, you're in the desert. There was just no, no toys and so there was this constant, like, where's Ray? Where is she? And so people would do hashtag where's Ray and they would take pictures in Target, like up and down the aisle and just be like, where is she? You know, like, I don't understand. And then this sort of brought up some other campaigns. Where's Gamora? Where's Leia? Where's Natasha from the Avengers? Because this seems to be, and I don't know if it's just this understanding that women don't collect, right? Maybe that's what it is. That doesn't mean I don't want like one Ray thing. Like I don't need all the Ray things, but just give me something. Um, and so where's Ray just sort of continued <laughs> with just this people who are just like, I don't understand. And then where's Ray? Like, where is she? Um, <laughs> and so that eventually they got JJ Abrams involved. Um, they got Hasbro involved through Twitter. Eventually there's Ray. And so there's Ray <laughs> was the response for Geek Girls. Um, here she is. Um, and Hasbro did make an official response to Jill Pantozzi. Jill Pantozzi was the redhead on the bottom right of the San Diego Comic-Con picture. So she's still working, right? Um, we love your passion for Ray. We're happy to share that we will be including her in the Monopoly Star Wars game. Okay, that was not enough, but sure. Um, but J.J. Abrams did respond and say, yeah, that's, not, that's completely unacceptable. So slice of life as a ritual. Um, to me, these are interesting. So this quote, you have a right to be here, right to acknowledge us as we are, right to document that. So Nagar has a lot of work about selfies and about how selfies are a form of feminist domestic activism. The, the amount of content being put out into the world, visual content of oneself in a domestic space that women are doing and how that operates on multiple levels. So I would say that in the spirit of that, that's what I think is happening with all of these hashtag geek girls selfies that are popping up primarily. You'll see those on Instagram and Twitter, but mostly Instagram at this point, right? Um, and they're interesting because it's showing women geeks in the middle of geeking, like mid geek, right? <laughs> like you're at home and your feet are up and you're watching One Piece, which is an anime. Like there, here's the evidence almost of, of my geekiness. And that's a little bit of selfie culture, right? Here's me, the evidence of me doing a thing. I didn't eat the meal unless I took a picture of me with the meal. Um, you know, I didn't go to the place until I did a selfie at the place. But here they're documenting what they're doing as a part of that. Um, here's another, this is not a selfie, but it's an interesting, like a little bit of a, a counter, right? There's some collecting going on here, clearly. Um, but this was a Force Girls account, and so all they do is repost women Star Wars fans. 
um, which is, I mean, it's a repost account. They're all, they want submissions and DMs of your selfies of your Star Wars fandom. Um, so let's dig into the wound. And this is the last real segment of this presentation that I'm so happy with it. So the wound, if you've um, at all been around Geek Girls, um, in 2012, um, the wound, in, I think in the serious way, happened um, for this community. So the ping has been considered a, a security risk as merely acknowledging a host presence turns it into a potential target. So this is straight from understandings of computer network pings, but it holds true here, I think, as a metaphor. Um, so there's a prominent comic book writer um, who put a post out on Facebook ranting, com vitriolic, completely incensed. This is all just one big rant. You don't need to see what he says. Just know he's angry and there's lots of caps about women preying on male fans you don't know shit about comics. I mean, he's just so angry, right, that women are involved in con spaces, that they're inviting themselves to con conversations. He's portraying them as these sort of evil hunters. Um, then came the memes. I'm such a nerd. Calm down. You're just a whore who found glasses. I mean, these got, this was um, sort of the nerd girl meme, which got re -memed for months and months and months. Um, so yeah, when you put yourself out there, you draw attention to yourself and that you do exist. So the assertion that I exist is in itself dangerous, right? Um, and so then she got re-memed. OMG, Star Trek is so cool. I love Luke Skywalker. Um, people making fun of that. This person was super angry about Natalie Portman in a Star Wars shirt and just assumed that she was just some hipster girl in a shirt. And so you can't read the quote, but they're just like, that hipster girl needs to take off that Star Wars shirt. She's not a fan. And people are just like, she's in the movie. She's, what are you talking about? So we have the idiot nerd girl meme. And then we have the accusation, right? What's happening here is that the accusation is that women are sirens, that geek girls are not um, that the ones you're seeing are not real, that there's some beauty expectation for what women can be if they're a real geek girl versus not a, re a, ge a, not a, a fake geek girl, rather. Um, learn the difference. It can save your life. Like, this is, like, in the type of um, propaganda tone of, like, communist, right? Like, you have to know them, infiltrate them, know them, save yourself. Um, it's an accusatory myth. It situates geek girls as this villainous, distracting outsider to the true hashtag geek collecting community. It also came at a time when geek girls solidified its move, in, geek girls solidified its move into the mainstream. So this myth is the, the siren, right? Like, it's this idea that these women are drawing you in enticing you because they're wearing a Star Wars shirt. Um, but really what they're going to do is consume you, um, right? Really what they're going to do, this gatekeeping is suggesting that women are going to come for other reasons. There's no real, they don't really engage with the content the way that they should. They like the story too much or they don't like it at all or really the options afforded. Um, and so this positions hashtag geek girls as taking the subculture and community off course. And that's what hashtag fake geek girls was doing. So what I think is interesting is we'll go back to Snyder and the Oreo. So the fear of indiscreet origins, right, is a concern that the copy will not only tamper with the original, but will author the original, or perhaps most fearful that the copy will come to be acknowledged as author father first. So how, how I mean, how common is that? How resonant is that, right? That, that someone's going to come in, consume and replace you is really the fear. Um, and so this to me is, is about this attempt. Fake, hashtag fake geek girls is an attempt to reroute the signal, reroute the ping, disrupt the ping, get in the middle of this process that the hashtag was doing originally. So this is where it gets fun. I thought that this quote from Sun Tzu was appropriate as it, it describes the, the response of the hashtag geek girls community as they attempt to reroute their own signal. So the proponents of fake geek girls forgot, I think, or maybe never really understood that the very substance of the geek ecosystem is absorption in some way or another. They forgot or didn't realize that it was this hashtag was operating in what Blackmore calls a memeplex, an ecology of memes. So the hashtag geek girls tribe absorbed hashtag fake geek girls and used it as a prop. 
So they created, they started grabbing accounts. They started grabbing Twitter accounts and Instagram accounts, but they were run by women. They started making images, fan art. Um, they, this is an a organization that took hashtag fake geek girls on a little like sign and took it to a con and found women in cosplay Women who had clearly spent hours, right, engaging with this content and said, here, hold this up. So this is what a fake geek girl looks like, someone who is dressed up as all these characters. Um, and so they reclaimed it, they reabsorbed it. And of course, the idiot nerd girl meme got remixed, which I think is beautiful, reappropriating your icons. Hasn't read all 900 issues of Batman, neither have you. Um, and then the Mary Sue um, launched um, earlier than this, but the Mary Sue launched as a, as a female driven geek blog. So I'm gonna return back to Francesca to, to help close us out here to talk about this work um, and just preface it, but I, I met Francesca last year at the Haystack Conference in Florida. I didn't realize she was uh, sitting in a session beside me like a couple rows over until she introduced herself to the room. And let me tell you, I just did that slow head turn where you're like, what? <laughs> um, because I, so I'm fangirled silently, squeezed silently um, over sitting next to her because she's pretty remarkable. Francesca studies fan fiction, but it's also personal for her as well. Mm. She was part of the second generation that picked up the mantle. And we had to do it old school in the mail. Sign, you, know, you had to get your mom to write you a check for a fan magazine. And you had to go to a, like a collector shop and you had to go to a bookstore. Like You needed to get a plane ticket to fly to a convention or get your mom to take you or get somebody to get a check to, to send away for the zine. Like You couldn't do it if you were 13 years old unaided. But now you can because it's online. You can do it from your bedroom. Not only does she read and write fan fiction, she also helped to create one of the biggest clearinghouses for fan fiction called Archive of Our Own. We started in 2007 and we started we started with a blank cursor of code, my friend. I mean, in other words, this was we designed it and we sort of, you know, people started saying, OK, here's what we need. We need. Do we have lawyers? Turns out fandom has lawyers. Like, do we have professors? Turns out we have professors. Turns out we have journalists. I mean, we had all of these sort of women come together and the coders literally were like, well, what since we're building it from scratch, let's build it to do exactly what we want. So um, Francesca, like I said, she's pretty remarkable. She, um, when I first started speaking with her and introduced herself, or introduced myself and said, okay, here's who I am. Here's what I like to talk about. Here's my, you know, what my interests are. She immediately said, oh, you're one of us. Um, so again, that feeling of tribe. Um, and she also, without me prompting, immediately launched into our tribal history, telling this story and just said, so what happened was, <laughs> um, we had all these people and we, you know, the lawyers came and the coders came. And so she really has internalized the story and wants to repeat it in this sort of oral tradition sense of like telling you where you've come from. Right. Um, and I really, I found that really meaningful and stirring because I had never considered all the labor behind some of the things that I get to enjoy um, and where I am in my fangirl um, sort of life where I've picked up. I, I guess maybe I'm like third wave or something like that. Um, but so Francesca is just really, she's a, what I would call part of the historical uh, history and background here. So we've talked about all of these things now. We've talked about the wound, but I want to revisit it one last time on this last slide. So the wound didn't divide um, in this case. It, it helped to define value, though. Um, and the way that the community handled its wound is how it handles every other story. It remixed it. It adapted it, it transformed it, it took the wound and made it part of its identity expression. So through the wound and all the practices and rituals that came out of it, the tribe started to tell its own story about how we are the chosen ones, how we are our own authors in this existence. Um, and that I think is very much the labor of, of fake geek girls. Um, so for next steps for me, um, I'm interested very much in blurred culture, which is something that's really become more prominent, um, I think, in terms of websites and blogs and uh, social media accounts and tribes, um, and that is black nerd culture. I'm interested in the ways that geeks and, and nerds and race interact. Um, Desi Geek Girls is another Twitter feed that I've started following um, of Indian women, and where and they're both geeky and nerdy, but they also talk about Bollywood. Um, Data mining for transformative works is something that's really gotten to be a lot, uh, very prominent in the last few years. If you go to fandomstats.org, you can do, uh, you can use an API that will help you look at 
fan fiction statistics from AO3 because AO3 is an open source platform with lots of tags and so they're able to look at a lot of data. Um, so that's something I want to get better at um, and talk about fangirl gatekeeping where even within this tribe is as remarkable as it is where is gatekeeping happening because gatekeeping continues to be a practice sort of everywhere. Um, and then geektivism. So, so much of what Hashtag Geek Girls did was starting to be this grassroots social movement of making things happen, moving things from the digital to the real. Um, and so I'm also interested in ways that other geeks are doing that sort of activism. Um, and yeah, that's my talk. So thank you. Mm -hmm.